Hi, and welcome to another module of the Benchmark webinar series. If you haven't already, check out the main webinar where we introduced this concept and talked about what the Benchmark study was, as well as some of our other modules in this series where we looked at other aspects of the genome engineering workflow. In this segment, we're going to cover clonal isolation. So we will look at how to derive single cell clones, work out how many clones you actually have to screen, and look at how you can determine if you have a single cell clone. So what is clonal isolation? This is the very tail end of the CRISPR editing workflow. This is where we have a transfected population of cells that we're now trying to make into a single cell population. So we're trying to derive a cell line from a single cell, thereby being a clonal population. Why do we have to do this? Well, CRISPR causes a lot of variable changes in different cells within that population. So we need to be able to isolate a single population with a single genetic change for better functional studies. So this is not always required. If we have a very high editing efficiency, especially in a knockout, we may be able to use that pool population of cells rather than making a clone because this can take a lot of time. However, if a gene knockout impacts cell growth where the cell grows a lot more slowly than the wild type cells, over time, those wild type cells will overgrow the knockout cells. And so in those situations, we do recommend clonal isolation to remove the contaminating wild type cells that will influence your experiments over time. In addition, clonal isolation is almost always required in knock-in experiments, where often the knock-in efficiency is quite low, so the percentage of successful cells will be low and we can't use that pool directly. So it's a very important step that a lot of people struggle with. This is actually, from the benchmark report, one of the most arduous steps that people report on doing. So how do we actually isolate clones? So as I mentioned, we take that population of cells, the cell pool, whether it's a knockout or a knock-in, and we seed these cells into containers. Usually this is 96 or 380 for well plates to isolate single clones. We then expand those uh, individual clones to work out what they are, and this is the process of genotyping. So how can we expand clones? One of the more common ways is using cell sorting. This can use fluorescent markers or non-fluorescent markers. Um, and some cell types can deal with this pretty easily. Our favorite method of choice is limiting dilution, where we seed the cells in a very low dilution mixture, usually about 0.5 cells per well, and then seed them in. And I'll explain why we do that specific percentage uh, in, in the next few slides. We can also do clonal picking. This is where we physically seed those cells in very, very low density. So the, the cells kind of form these colonies all on their own. And then we manually pick cells off the plate. This is very popular in the IPSC world. However, cells are very motile, which means they move around that plate. So we don't recommend clonal picking because you can get a lot of cell contamination with different colonies, even if they're far apart from each other. Uh, so we do recommend something that physically separates the cells to ensure that you're getting that clonal population. And there's some newer techniques such as cell printing that can increase these uh, the percentages, but obviously you do need specialist hardware to be able to do this. But if you do a lot of clonal isolation, uh, this is a, a good option to look into. So how many clones do we actually have to screen? Well, from the benchmark report, we know that the majority of people actually screen about 137 clones. So right in the middle between 100 and 200 clones. And it didn't matter whether they were in academia or industry, this was really across the board. In very startingly, uh, there were some people that are screening over 500 clones. So this is a huge amount of clones. And this is a very arduous process. because you can imagine, you need to have one set that you're growing up, and then you have to split those and keep track of two sets so that you can genotype the other set and work out which clones you actually want. So how do we know how many clones to pick? Well, it's really a numbers game. So there's two parts to this. One is, 
how many clones will physically grow. So if you see, for example, a 384 well plate as pictured, how many will actually form single cells? And this is very cell line dependent. Some cell lines will grow colonies much more readily than others, as well as being biologically dependent on the edit. Obviously, some edits may cause some detriment to the cell, and so those clones may be harder to grow and isolate, and you may have some natural selection, either increasing or reducing the number of clones you're going to get. The second part in this is of the clones that do grow, how many do you actually have to screen? And this requires analysis of the efficiency and the pool, and you can improve this with optimization. So let's dive into part one. How do we know how many clones to pick? So unfortunately, we have to introduce a little bit of statistics. So there is a statistical model called the Poisson distribution, which can help us determine if we see a certain number of cells, how many each well can get. And so by using Poisson distribution, we can actually calculate the probability of, the theoretical probability, I should say, of how many wells will be seeded as zero, one, or more than one cells per well. So this is what I've done here. So what you can see here, if we seed one cell per well, 36% of a 96 well plate will get no cells, 36% will get one cell per well, and 26% will have more than one cell per well. So obviously we don't really want the two extremes. We don't want zero cells, and we definitely don't want more than one cell because we won't necessarily know that that clone started from more than one cell unless we have a way of being able to identify this. And I'll show you how we do this at Synthago, but it's not always something that everyone can do on their own. So really what we want to try to do is maximize the number of wells with one cell and reduce the risk of having a, a polyclonal population, a population with more than one cell that derived that clone. So we want to really reduce the last column at, and, and try to keep the, the one cell per well as high as we can. So, let's, so in one cell per well, we really have a, a quarter of the clones that are growing are going to be more than one cell per well. So really this is not ideal because there's, there's going to be a lot of uh, error that we're going to have because the potential of finding a clone that's multi-clone derived is really high here. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if we now seed less than, than one cell and go down to 0.3 cells per well, you can see here that there's a very large proportion of cells, about 70 so percent, that will have no cells. Whereas we're now dropping to 23% of one cell per well, but we've also minimized the number of wells that will have more than one cell to 3%. So this is, this is great, but we have a lot of empty wells that are going to come out of this. So where is the Goldilocks? Where is that perfect, uh, perfect amount? So what we recommend is 0.5 cells per well as a seeding density, because this allows us to have about 30% of one cell per well. We can reduce more than one cell per well to about 9% while keeping the, and we'll still have a high percentage of no cells per well, but we're at least kind of in that nice Goldilocks balance between too few clones in general and too many clones that are going to be more than one cell per well. And obviously you can play with this based on your cell line and how much risk you want to take. So we have, now that we have some clones, say that we used 0.5 cells per well in a 96 well plate. Based on Poisson distribution, we expect 30% of those wells to have a one cell derived clone. So that means out of a 96 well plate, we should have about 98 wells that should grow a clone. So now we have to add our editing efficiency on top of this probability. So for example, if we have an editing efficiency of 50%, out of those 28 clones, we should theoretically get 14 correct clones. Now what happens if we get a lower efficiency? If we get a 10% efficiency, which is a good uh, ballpark for a, a knock-in experiment, we would find two clones only. If this goes lower to 1%, which is also something that happens common, uh, is a common occurrence in knock-in experiments, we would have one, one cell per well, one clone to screen. So this means that from your editing efficiency in the pool, you can use this to determine how many plates of cells you may have to use. If you're getting very low efficiencies, 1%, you may have to plate 10 96 well plates to be able to get a couple of clones to be able to find. 
So one word of caution is this is really a theoretical approximation of how many clones you would expect to get. Biology obviously can come in and change all of this. So the biology of the cell line as well as the edit itself could require these numbers to be much higher. Maybe that cell line doesn't form clones readily. And so these numbers will be much, much higher because you'll start off with having much fewer wells that have clones. Or maybe your, your edit causes a biological phenotype, which means the efficiency, regardless of what you started with, will drop and will be much harder to find the clone that you're looking for. So how do we do it at Synthago? Well, we're very lucky that we have an automated and high throughput single cell cloning platform. And this allows us to do single cell cloning in a 384 well system. So we can set up 384 wells of clones and see how many we get out of that. So we can get lots and lots of clones and we can set up multiple 384 well plates if necessary. As I mentioned um, in the main webinar, we have an automated clonal hip picking process so that we can try to automatically pick some of these clones. And how do we know that, that the clones are correct? But we also do an automated imaging pipeline. So I'll show you an example of that. In addition, we have an automated genotyping platform that we use both for the optimization that I mentioned in the earlier module, as well as for genotyping of the clones. So here we use Sanger sequencing and ICE, uh, the inference of CRISPR editing software that we mentioned in the analysis module to validate every clone that we get. So this really helps us work out that our clones are from a single clone because we have the, the genotyping data from ICE as well as that imaging data. So this really allows us to determine that our clone has actually come from a single clone. And I'm about to play you a short video of what this, these images look like. So you can see here, we start at day, day one and every couple of days, we can see this clone expand into a large colony. And you can see that we have no other colonies that are being formed and no other cells are present at that early time point. So this is how we can see, and we do this for every single clone that we hit pick, we confirm uh, by eye to ensure that what we're actually picking is a single cell derived clone. So this is a really cool automated system that we've set up here at Synthago to really ensure the robustness and the quality of the clones that we're providing to, to the research community. So single cell cloning is obviously painful. So can we, can we make it better? Can we enrich for the population of cells that we're trying to find? So I've shown this slide before, but I think it's worth uh, pulling it back up again because genomic instability is a huge concern when we're doing CRISPR and a lot of other ways in which we're manipulating the cells may cause more genomic instability. So we know that antibiotics and mammalian antibiotics that are used for enrichment can cause a whole lot of different genomic off-target effects outside of CRISPR. And I think this is something that, that we need to continue highlighting because these are very commonly used. And I don't know if as a field, we have really realized that these may have detrimental effects to our cells. Um, and if we're getting high enough efficiencies, we shouldn't need to use selection. And even if you have selected a population of cells, you still have to go through the single cell cloning workflow. So it doesn't really remove a step in, of the workflow and may actually cause unintended consequences to your cells. So what I've gone through today is that clonal isolation is a numbers game. And this comes in two parts. One is how many clones you'll have to grow from a single cell. And then out of the clones that you did get, how many do you actually have to screen? And you can use your editing efficiency from the pool to make a, a guesstimate as to how many you might need to do. And now thinking about numbers of clones, if you just screened 100 clones, we estimate that you would need about 400 Eppendorf tubes and 1,700 pipette tips just to be able to genotype and split those cells once. This obviously is an immense amount of effort, blood, sweat, and tears, and requires an immense amount of concentration to be able to do this. Um, and we've even had people come to us and say, you know, I had to block out an entire day just to be able to do this because it takes so much effort and really wrap myself up to be able to do it. 
So this is not a trivial task. It seems relatively easy, but we are talking about hundreds of wells and hundreds of samples that you have to track. And if you're not established to do this, if you don't have a good system, this can go wrong in lots of different ways. So this is something to think about, about when you're looking at doing clonal isolation. And we have a really nice protocol on clonal isolation with some great tips and tricks in there as well at synthogo.com slash resources. So that's all on clonal isolation. As a reminder, definitely check out the other modules in this series if you haven't already. And the last coming up will be number five, compare your options. So join me for that one to look at, is it worth to do this yourself? What does it actually cost? And what is the real cost of outsourcing? So thanks for joining me. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at synthago.com contact. And thank you for joining us.